All right, what's going on everyone? Welcome back. We are here at the Brinkley RV factory doing a full factory tour. This is part two, so if you missed part one, go back and watch it because we kind of talked about the culture. We started way over here, looked at frames. Uh, we looked at some of the, the, the production and how it takes place and how things are easier to access by employees. And we made our way to about here. So we're gonna continue on. Uh, we talked about some of the equipment they use back here, basically the mentality around buy once cry once man you can even use that here too right everyone talks about that with rvs buy once cry once but like a saw like this that is intelligent that gives them the ability to make more precise cuts buying the right piece of equipment and investing in it as much as people think rvs are just overpriced the, the reality is they have to buy stuff like this they have to build factories like this and equip it with all of this stuff to make an rv process happen i couldn't even imagine how much a factory like this would cost to build um, that said though there are reasons why why if you want certain rvs and you want a certain level of quality you may have to pay a little bit more for it and the reason is is they put more time effort and energy into their processes and their equipment to make it happen so this is part two we're going to kick it off hang tight i'll be right back All right, so in front of me, I still have Nick and I have Mike, operations and sales. And we're gonna move on to the next station. I'll let you guys lead me along and we'll continue where we left off. So as you can see, our walls are over here. We actually build all our walls in um, a separate location. And um, we bring everything over. And as you can see, we have the hoists that roll out and we can bring all our walls out and so we're not manhandling them and we're not twisting the walls as we um, put them on the units. Very cool. Now, you guys use Asdale on your walls, correct? Yes, Asdale on the exterior underneath a uh, fiberglass and Luan on the interior. Okay, do you know if you have any plans of using Asdale on the interior wall as well? Um, as of right now, we do not. Um, okay. It's something we're, um, we've talked about uh but as of right now we want to stick to with luan okay we're just more comfortable with luan right okay. now. okay and i understand that and and i think that the message for most people is is if you can keep water outside of your rv then it really doesn't matter what you use for your interior wall asdell is an impervious composite material that prevents delamination it won't build up mold rot mildew so technically again if as long as you can keep moisture out of your rv yep. then it's perfectly fine to use whatever material you really feel comfortable with and yeah. screw, the screw retention is a lot better on the Luan oh, yeah. than the Asdale as well. Absolutely, with wood in general, right? That's why a lot of times you see wood for certain parts just for screw retention. Very good. So we have the walls over here, and then they get put on here. Do they? Where do they route the walls? Is that all done at your... That's all your... done over at our other, uh, lamination facility. Okay, very good, very good. Mm -hmm. All right. Here are the truss systems for their roof right here. Yep. Um, this is something that uh, we're really proud of. Um, we build our roof all on a jig. And so all the rafters will be at the exact same spot from unit to unit to unit. And what a lot of people do is they build their roofs in eight foot sections. And so if you imagine like a 35, mm -hmm. 40 foot unit um, and you put decking on every four feet and if a rafter is off, you're gonna start running off. Uh, with your decking and our rafters will always be in the same spot because it, it's built on a jig Then it goes out on the unit and everything's tight your luon on, on the inside will always be tight mm -hmm. and always be the same Because we're not trying to put a bunch of eight foot pieces together. Okay, and uh, I noticed of course This is a wood construction and there's some manufacturers who use steel construction and I'm imagining The same reason a lot of manufacturers who do use wood construction use it is for screw retention the, the fact that it's just from a couple different perspectives it's more of a solid material and so i've actually worked at a place where we used aluminum rafters and to try to get your luon tight with staples um it's nearly impossible mm -hmm. um, and what we actually do is the seams of the luon we staple but in the fields it's all glued okay what do you use for your decking uh, decking is gonna be three eighths Three eighths inch tongue yeah. and groove, or is uh, it just standard no, three eighths inch? Just standard, OSB? and then we'll tape it and okay. sand it down. Uh, a couple other things. The reason we use wood too is insulation is much better. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, if you're driving down the road, it's like an earthquake, right? So you have a little bit more flex. You need to have that flex so things don't break. Okay. What what type of uh, covering are you putting over your roof? 
TPO. TPO? Yep. Okay. All right, very good. All right, let's move on. Okay, so this is a station that a lot of people are gonna really wanna see and they're gonna be impressed by. This is a wiring harness, 12 volt. So everything that's 12 volt, which makes up the bulk of what's in an RV. You got a lot of 110, you got yep. a lot of Romex, and they got a bit of that right here too. This is basically for 110, yep. your, your residential style electricity. Yep. This is your 12 volt stuff right here. Yep, and so we buy, we buy this in, um, and at the ends of each one, like bedroom lights, Oh, everything's labeled. Everything's labeled. Um, antenna booster. So everything's labeled. It stays labeled. We don't tear these off. And then, like I said in video one, yeah. every one is cut at the right crimped, length. or not crimped, but cut at the exact same length. Yeah, that is really cool. So, and so if you put it into a Wago, um, you don't have any raw wire sticking out because it's all. Uh, cut to the exact length cut to that length. it needs so to be. This is interesting for me because if you peel back the, the sheathing behind most RVs, you'd be surprised how much excess wire that yep. they bundle up and just leave in the underbelly of an RV. Uh, I, I actually trimmed some out of our fifth wheel. And when I was said and done with it, I felt as if I was throwing away like $50 worth of wire. Oh, it, it's I, insane. I don't doubt that. And, and it's uh, funny, we used to fill up Trash Hopper like a big trash hopper full of wire um, and previous places that I worked because you know you measure everything arm length well we buy these wire harnesses in it's to exact size and you know when we go to prototype it's kind of, of a guessing game but after that we can call our uh, supplier and be like hey take a foot off of this wire take two feet off of mm -hmm. this add another foot on onto this yep. and so it's yep. all exact and we don't have a bunch of extra wires laying in that's true. And what, what's kind of funny, totally off topic though, you look at this wiring harness. If you want to see a wiring harness, look at an automotive wiring harness. It's insane how many wires go through and how small yeah. those wires are. Yeah. So this is one huge, huge step for the industry in general. Um, I don't know if other manufacturers will adopt it though. There's a lot of cool, cool ideas out there, but for the most part, if it's been working for them, they don't change. Yeah. And, and I think um, it's one of those things where we got to do it out of the get go. Yep. Um, it will be a painful process for somebody that's up and running right now. And for us, we're used to it now and it's yep. normal and this is what we do. But there's so many things that we got to do from the get go and, and mm -hmm. we don't, we get to do, we don't got to do. And yeah. so that, I think that's the difference on, and that's the unique thing of starting up a new yep. manufacturing facility. But that is very cool. The one nice thing that I like to talk to people about with doing this is when you have a warranty issue, you got electrical issues, you're not gonna be spending more money on the labor intensive part of it because it's gonna be easier for the dealership or if you wanna do it independently to find the wire. Um, you're spending hours researching, trying to figure out what wire goes where. Mm -hmm. With us, it's gonna be a lot easier. Um, we've manufactured uh, our units to be um, worked on easily um, if there's issues. So once again, if you have an issue with a light in the bedroom, you're gonna know where that light is really quickly yeah yeah that is really cool i love the fact that you guys are using these um, and i can imagine the burn-in period to get everyone trained and to figure out how you run a wiring harness because it's mapped at that point yep. everything has to be mapped and i can imagine it's it's a tremendous undertaking but just like anything else when you build the culture from the start around that it, it it's it's just mastering that culture at that point yep. it's not having to to try to relearn everything yep. which is really cool all right, I think we are ready to move on to the, so we got the roof structure in place. This is where they start to put all the batted insulation. And so the difference between here, here, and here is here they put the roof on with the ducting in place. Here they start wiring things into the roof, like your puck lighting, things like that. And here they start putting the insulation over all of that. Did I nail it? You nailed it. All right, cool deal. Yep. And then they got this really cool gantry up here, which helps them spread their radiant barrier, their astrofoil, or whatever you want to call this stuff. Man, that's thick stuff, though. Yep. That is not that is not the typical no, that's... material. Wow, I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting something a lot thinner than that. This um, it's hard to to show you on camera, but it feels more like a tarp. That's how thick that feels. That is pretty crazy. And then they have their OSB up top, 
and this cool machine goes down. So typically in a factory, you got people carrying these boards around from a pile. They walk out on the sides and they start throwing boards on top. But this machine allows them to lay the radiant barrier down. And as they go, they can drop a piece of four by eight on top of it and they can start affixing it. And it's simply the process of sliding a panel off. Yep. Right? And uh, this is actually operated with a wireless remote. And so you're not asking your people to run out with few sheets of decking on their shoulders and yeah, yeah just yep. saves bodies and when they run out of this they grab a forklift take this yeah. and then reload their machine here which is rated for 4500 pounds i kind of want one of those <laughs> don't have any use for it but i kind of want one all right so let's see what's going on over here this looks like a Mike, dust capturing system yeah actually um this is um a dust collector for our uh, decking grinder, our decking sander. Um, so we don't have a bunch of um, dust flying in the in the air when we go to sand our decking, mm -hmm. and um, which is normal. And this thing um, has enough suction you can actually lay a um, sander down, have it running, and it won't move because it has that much suction. And as you can see, like. Yeah, it's a very clean work environment. Basically dust free and this is a huge, huge contributor to that. So people don't realize again, going back to woodworking, dust in the air can create sickness. Yep. It can get inside your lungs and it can actually start to create mold inside of your lungs. It's very, very dangerous. So old cabinetry shops, people would get sick all the time. Dust collection systems are super important and having a high-end industrial system like this for a function like that, mm -hmm. again, it's longevity of the health of your employees and something like this is super important to have. So that's really cool. It's good to see stuff like that. And I saw another one back there for your saw as well. I yeah, saw a couple of them back we, there. Uh, we're actually in the process of um, installing a central, um, like a big one. Like a big dust collection yeah, system, yeah. For, for all of our saws and our cnc router very cool all right so we have the roofs on over here we have all the holes routed out for all of our vents and all of our air conditioning units and all of that uh what is this what are we at right now this looks like tracks and rails for various things yep these are um awning rails and gutter rails okay so this is what we call metal department and this is where the unit gets plugged and all the um, baggage doors get put in the entrance door and over here in the scaffolds is where we put our gutter rails and awning rails on. Very good. And then you get the roof over here. It's kind of funny um, when you said the roof is TPO. You know, there's all these moves for PVC, TPO and all these and 10 years, oh, not 10 years, let's just say five years ago, that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. If you did, if you had TPO or if you had any of the other types of technologies, one was always better than the other, but they've all really gotten good now. I, I, you know, it's weird because I had a conversation a while back with the folks who actually produced the PVC roofs and the TPO roofs. And they said, yeah, if you asked me like five to seven years ago, which one I'd prefer, I'd say PVC. But now the chemical formula that they're using for them and the, ro the robustness and the the, just how long they last, the tear resistance, how they've cross-woven everything. It's all gotten really good now, so it, it really doesn't matter. They don't stain anymore. They don't make any of the marks anymore. It's just, it's a really good material. But um, was that mainly the reason why you decided to go with this, or were there uh, yeah, other reasons? I would say, I would say um, the biggest, there's a lot of good roofs out right now, but I would say the biggest um, issue is the self-level that people put down and the way they um the butyls that they put underneath their components that they put on the roofs mm -hmm. i think today that's probably the biggest thing that um separates us from a lot of people it, it's not so much the the roof we do put a good roof down but it's how we seal our roofs off yeah yeah that matters too if you don't seal it well it doesn't matter what kind of roof yeah. material you have very good all right so we're going to work our way down Okay, so we have exited the mezzanine. We are on ground level. I see LED lighting. I love the fact that you use the little strip lights, which are pretty cool. Or I don't really know what you would call those. Are they strip lights or just LED flat LED, lights? Yeah, yeah they look really nice though. Very automotive. And I know that's kind of what you were going for with the look of this is to have more of that automotive feel to it. I love the logo. I mean, that is just, or the wording. 
That is really, really beautiful. It just looks great on your unit. Your logo looks great. The schemes are interesting because to me, they feel retro. They don't feel like, I, when I look at the, the graphics, it doesn't feel overly modern to me. It doesn't feel overly edgy. It feels, it feels like that steam pop kind of vibe, kind of retro, but it's kind of cool. It bleeds into that automotive feel again. Uh, wired for Furion wireless backup cameras. This one actually has a camera on it. Yes. So do you prep your cameras on the unit on the line or later down? I guess you prep it on the line then, don't you? Yeah. And uh, we actually install the cameras and uh, the um, the monitors and everything get shipped with the with Okay. The, uh, yeah. That's so it's really not just cool. a prep. We install them. Oh, so on all your units? Yeah. It's standard. Oh. Yeah, wow. So, okay. So I don't have to walk around your units and say, hey, look, it's prepped for a Furion wireless backup no, camera. You they, put the camera on there. Yep. And it's not only a backup camera, it's an observation. So as you're driving down the road, you can see what's behind you. If someone's tailgating, mm -hmm. if you got something on your hitch, you can see if it's bouncing. Okay. Um, so it really, you can use it for multi-purpose. Do you prep for side view or do you put the side views on? We, uh, we do not, not okay. here. We don't. Put okay. No, that's fine. I, I love the fact that you put the backup camera on. That's super cool. Mm -hmm. Or the observation camera. Yep. yep. Very nice. You got your receiver here, and I see a four-way connector here. So I am gonna, I'm gonna bring up the most controversial video I've ever made in the last three months. And whether you guys saw it or not, you probably didn't see it. It was my opinion on towing with a fifth wheel. Mm -hmm. And I tell people all the time, every time I get to the back, I point out there's a two-inch receiver and it's just made for an accessory rack. Or there's a two-inch receiver, you got chain holds and you have a four-way connector here for lights for your, your tiny trailer because typically these are only rated to 300 pounds tongue weight, 3,000 pounds towing capacity. Is that what yours is rated at? Yep. Okay. I never recommend towing behind a fifth wheel. And I do that not just based on my own arbitrary, you know, knowledge of should you do it from a safety perspective. I do that because I actually have worked in the industry long enough that I've had folks that tell me towing behind a fifth wheel can cause undue stress over time to the sidewalls of your RV because you're putting leverage on the entire length of the frame where it's hitched up to the vehicle and all the way to the back. Now, your RVs are obviously designed to allow for towing behind them. But do you suggest it? What's your opinion? What's your take on that? Well, I would say one, it's gonna be your comfort level. Um, but two, you know, our warranty is gonna be, you know, the one year, you know, complete one year bumper to bumper, three year structural. Um, obviously you are gonna have a little more stress on it, but you know, we build it to the standard for being able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think most people that I talk to that do it are seasoned vets that know what they're doing mm -hmm. and or people that drive semi trucks or whatnot. Yeah. I wouldn't um, suggest it for anybody that hasn't pulled for a long period of time because it does um, take some technique to be able to do that. Yeah. And there's a significant amount of, I don't want to say math, it's not necessarily math, but you have to know how to balance your trailer, okay. right? So if you have a trailer and let's say the trailer weighs a thousand pounds and you're going to put 2000 pounds worth of stuff in it, depending on where you place that stuff, how much hit, hitch weight you're actually transferring to the back of your trailer, all of that stuff's going to matter. And that's the main reason why I don't recommend it. A, backing up is pretty much not going to exist for you anymore because some people can do that, but most people can't but uh, backing up is going to be a problem for most people. I'm going to say 99% of people. But more importantly, I, I feel as if it does put additional stress on the frame of the RV. And you do provide a warranty, one-year warranty for the bumper-to-bumper, two-year structural. Three. Three-year three. structural. Yep. But beyond those three years, if you do have some type of a failure on the frame, and it's because you were towing. I just, again, you guys offer a great warranty. I just, I never recommend it. So it's great to hear from a company that actually puts it on and says you can do it, but I, that's just the way I've always been. So rack and pinion slides, again, I like them. A lot of people just call them through frame slides. That's kind of the Lippert terminology for it. Um, in my opinion, it's, it's great because it holds the main bulk of the sidewall and that's, or the main bulk of your slide box. And that's really important to me. Um, and again, on your smaller slides, your wardrobe slides, pretty much all the different slide technologies work fine. They do. I like your example though, of the slim rack where it doesn't allow water to come into the RV. So that is really cool. 
All right, so I think we're gonna wrap this video up as part two, and then we're gonna do a part three video, which will essentially include everything else down the line, which will probably even include PDI, I'm imagining. Yep. So let's uh, let's wrap this video up. Stay tuned for part three. If you haven't had a chance, please take a moment, subscribe to my channel, give me a thumbs up. We'll talk to you again very soon. And check out part one if you missed it.